Hi, I'm Lisa Walker, and I'm going to talk to you about physician credentialing. Credentialing is the process in which an organization goes through to vet a provider that is interested in working for their organization. The process is done to ensure that the credentials that are being provided are true and correct. First and foremost, credentialing is confidential. In accordance with many state codes, the state code of South Carolina that says that credentialing is confidential is code 40-71-20. This code states that all information that is shared by a provider cannot be shared with another organization or regulatory agency and is only to be used by that organization for which the provider is applying. The providers complete a request for consideration. The request for consideration is then submitted to the Credentialing Processing Center and they go through the process of performing the verification. The verification is done to ensure that the information is absolutely accurate before a provider is granted privileges. To be considered for credentialing, the following must be verified by the CPC. They must ensure that they have an unrestricted license. The license doesn't necessarily have to be from the state in which they are applying, but it could be from another state, and there's a couple criteria that exclude them from mandating having a current state license. If they are active military personnel, they can care for other active military personnel in a different state while they are going through the application process. Another reason that they may be granted an exception is they can write to the board and the board can grant an exception during the licensing process to grant them a temporary license and they can practice within another state. They must also be a graduate of an accredited medical school. If they are not a graduate in the United States, there are a couple processes that they can go through to ensure that they are granted state licensure so that they can practice. They must meet requirements, and the requirements are that they must have graduated from a valid residency program or fellowship for the specialty in which they're applying. They must have an unrestricted or unencumbered DEA license. Many states also require that they provide a list of controlled substances for which they are going to be writing prescriptions for dependent upon the role in which they're applying. They must also verify that they have held malpractice insurance. The malpractice insurance must be aligned with the hospital requirements as far as the minimum coverages. They must also be able to show that they have had a history of having um, malpractice insurance without having any breaks in coverage. Requirements for insurance reimbursements. During the credentialing process, uh, providers must also apply with insurance companies to become a provider that is within the network. The in-network providers get paid at a higher reimbursement rate and not going through this credentialing process with participating providers could also mean that their reimbursements are slower. They could be lower. They could be non-existent. And what typically happens is they increase the fees to patients to recoup those reimbursements and with a patient who has a higher deductible or more out of pocket, what generally happens is the provider's office ends up either writing off the expenses or turning them over to collections. So there are a couple different types of credentialing, emergency credentialing and disaster credentialing. Emergency credentialing could be the process that one needs to take to provide care to a patient that is at their facility. 
for example, if I had a patient that was critically ill and needed ECMO, but I did not have a provider at my facility that could provide the care to this patient, I may partner with a neighboring facility nearby that I could send this patient to to receive the care, and this physician could come to our facility to initiate the process and care for this patient and the emergency credentialing could last anywhere from 24 to 72 hours typically. In a disaster situation, people can be granted disaster privileges simply by proving that they are a U.S. citizen by providing a driver's license. And they can provide a copy of their license, which primary source validation can easily occur. And they can also provide copies of their credentials such as BLS, ACLS, and whatever extended educational needs may be necessary for them to participate. In a disaster situation, it could be anywhere from 90 to 100 de 180 days in length, depending upon the disaster situation. The board's role, now the board in this particular case is in regards to the organization. So the board can certainly play a part in the credentialing process because once all of the documents have been vetted, it goes to the board for the board to evaluate whether or not it's appropriate based on the findings of the CPC. And they can vote as to whether or not they want this provider to be a member of their team. If they decide that this person is an, an adequate member of the team and they decide to onboard them, then the hiring process continues. If the vote says that this person maybe was not up front, didn't provide accurate information, they can vote to veto this person joining and they have to provide a reason as to why this person has been declined. At any time during a person's credentialing process when they've been granted privileges, those privileges can be revoked. Revocation can occur if malpractice has occurred or during an investigation, if there is any complaint of abuse or wrongdoing. Um, so when revocation does occur, it can occur with a pending investigation and the provider is included in the process throughout the entire way and given the opportunity to ask questions and um, is privy to any information that is found in regards to the event. Please share any questions that you may have on the discussion board and I will be happy to answer them. Thank you for your time.